might want to help uh, if I turn my mic on. How's it going, guys? Welcome back to Baltimore Comic Con. Hope you're enjoying all the fun. Uh, we have had an absolute blast here. It's only day, what, two? Is it Saturday? I just saw our host popped in, Mr. John Suntress. He's going to be doing a deep dive uh, on horror comic books. we got a massive panel uh, that's about to start right now. So without further ado, John, if you are ready, my good friend, sir, there he is. John, hey, man. Sorry, man, John, can I just say you are burning your candle at, at like five different ends today. You are jumping from Hall A to Hall B to the Ringo Hall, back to Hall B, back to Hall A. Well, you are uh, just doing the Lord's work here, Paul. Yeah, it's all right. Hey, man, we're, we're all, uh, we got hit, uh, mainframe guys got hit with COVID really bad. So we are we are kind of spinning plates and jumping from room to room. So He's I'm kidding. sorry I'm He's late. kidding. All right, John, I'm going to hop out. You guys have fun. Thanks, buddy. All right, excellent. This is going to be great, man. I'm really excited to... Uh, talk to uh, my friends here because uh, they all have incredible horror books that they're doing and it's going to be a pleasure to talking to all of them uh let me start wel welcoming people here's somebody that i haven't seen in a while uh, we did uh, uh terrificon uh was it last year i think it was last year or two years maybe it was two years ago but it's a fool richardson welcome a fool it's great to see you good to see you thank you very much for doing this this is going to be great i'm really excited to talk about uh some of the really exciting things that you've been doing lately a good buddy of mine he's got a he's got a great book uh right now and it's from vault comics it's mike marisi everybody good to see you mike hey happy to be here how you doing john i'm doing all right man spinning as i was saying spinning plates but <laughs> good to, it's, it's good to be here and I'm, I'm really glad everybody's here and then another great friend of mine mike is a, a chicago friend of mine Afua, and I got another guy that's coming on right now. He's done incredible work over the years, a lot of interesting horror work. It's uh, Jim Terry, everybody. It's good to see you, Jim. Hey, cool. hey, can you hear me all right? You sound great, buddy. Okay, good. Absolutely. Well, welcome to all of you, and it's uh, it's exciting to talk about uh, all of your books. And uh, again, you'll forgive me because I am spinning plates right now. But uh, I want to. I want to. Uh, I, I I'll start with uh, Mike because uh, Mike, and right now, damn it. I want to say the coffin. I know it's vault. It's probably not the oh, coffin. The plot. Your, the plot. Thank you. The plot. I knew it had some, yeah, exactly. I knew it had something to do with cemeteries. Exactly. <laughs> the, the coffin sounds pretty awesome, though. <laughs> yeah, I'm Plot's into the been, idea. The plot's been amazing. Where are you in the book? I know it's wrapping up soon, isn't it? Or not? Yeah. Uh, oh, gosh. Uh, six just came out. Uh, I think seven is technically done or very close to done uh and we're all written i mean eight is eight is written we're all done that and eight is the end that's the end of the story uh we started out wanting to do eight that was the goal um we knew it was a limited story uh the way like you know kind of like um thinking of a model like hill house uh haunting hill house which which is something i love which is a one season beginning middle of end we kind of want to follow that model where it's like this is a story that's it and then we're then we'll be out so we're almost there that's cool, man. No, it's beautifully drawn. It's it's very creepy, yeah. and I and I and it's great to talk to three artists about this as well because uh, I you know you it's great that uh, the the level of, of terror that you guys can, can uh, achieve with your art. A fool, you're doing something really cool. You are working with Lovecraft Lovecraft Country, and you've yeah. been doing illustration for them. Tell us about that. That's amazing. Great HBO show. I'm sure everyone that's watching right now is aware of aware of the show. But yeah, first of all. <coughs> Like, explain what you're doing and also how you got the gig. Um, first, I was recommended. So thank you to all my friends who um, dropped my name in that hat. But um, I am responsible for all the illustrations that are hand-drawn by the actress Jada Freeman, who plays Diana, Jada Harris, Diana Freeman. See, I've mixed them up because now they're one and the same. Like, D is... Yeah. Sorry, Jada, I love you. When actor and character become <laughs> one, I totally understand. Exactly, Absolutely. exactly. So it's been really cool because um, a lot of it was filmed here in Georgia. And uh, I worked on set. I worked directly with the executive producer, Misha Green, and the props master, J.P. Jones, just to make the Atlas book, make the hand-drawn comic books, as well as like actual like tangible comics yeah. uh, because the main actors are nerds. And so they, um, uh, I, I made all of that stuff. And it was really cool because during the season finale, no spoilers, but they gave me a name drop and- Oh, that's great. Happens. It hey, that's awesome. Happens. It's super cool. They sort of spoke about me like I was a character 
in the story. So I cried and uh, I sent a message to my dad. Oh, that's lovely. That's great. <laughs> no, I know that feeling. Absolutely. That's wonderful, man. So, like, I mean, obviously the show's a massive hit. So I imagine, I mean, I'm sure a season two is, uh, you know, a certainty. Um, Obviously, when they get to it, no. It's in talks right now. I, I know with COVID, okay. everything is kind of, you know, on pause. But um... and and without speaking out of school, mm -hmm. I I would think, especially like you said, with COVID, that might delay production. Is okay. there any talk of maybe a, a you know a graphic novel of of the character's stuff that you would be ghosting or anything like appropriately for a horror panel that you would be ghosting <laughs> uh, that stuff. Well, they've um, a lot of people have asked, and uh, there wasn't a lot of time to to make it into a full comic because that's what we wanted to. We wanted to have a complete comic yeah. for the show as kind of this backstory. But there were so many different moving parts and changing scenes that we didn't get a chance to do that. But um, I'm actually working on a creator-owned project, my first creator-owned since hey! oh, man, my start like <clears throat> 15 years ago in comics, and. Um, uh, it's going to be <coughs> stories. It's going to be called Aquarius, the Book of Mer, and I'm doing like a modern retelling of mermaid myths and legends from all over the world. And I'm um, launching the Kickstarter on Black Friday of this year. So as a perk, I'm going to have an art book with all of the Lovecraft art and everything that I've worked on in the past five years. That's outstanding. That's wonderful. Well, hey, uh, you'll come back on Word Balloon and we'll talk more properly yeah, about uh, the campaign. That'd be great. Jim, you've got a long history in horror uh going back and i don't mean to age us but uh you know you uh you got to work with uh, one of the one of the greats of uh of comics james obar and got to work on the crow and uh i mean that's that's the earliest comic horror stuff that of yours that i'm aware of uh is there earlier stuff uh that's my first published work oh there you go that, that book with james and uh and yeah we started off big fans of ec comics both he and I, that's kind of how we forged our friendship and uh, talking about old comics and the EC war books and the Jack Davis stuff. The, that that was uh, the basis of what we wanted to do was a scary version of The Crow that might feel at home between the 50s and maybe 1979, you know. And uh, and so, yeah, that, that's, uh, that was my first published work. That's awesome. You know, uh, Mike was on uh, with Tim Seeley, and we were playing a horror trivia a few weeks ago on Word Balloon. We had a blast. And I do want to be know, on that. <laughs> hey, man. Oh, seriously. No, honestly, you're all invited. I'm so, I've, I've been, we've been so busy planning Baltimore that I really did want to do a couple more horror trivia nights before Halloween. But, you know, Halloween's, you know, year round. Who cares? So, like, we should, you know, I mean, True. I'm trying to think if I, I don't know if I have a, a Friday this this Friday uh, show <laughs> planned. You know, I was going to reach uh, to my buddy Steve Darnall, who's an old time radio host, and talk about uh, radio horror because I love listening to uh, the old shows like Inner Sanctum and Suspense and all these great shows that he really did uh, it lights out an incredible yeah. Chicago writer Arch Obler uh, just made a, a really effective audio horror. And uh, I was wondering, yeah, what are what were some of yours as we can go around the horn and start with Afua. Uh, tell me about um, your horror influences and what you read or watched and everything that kind of, you know, made you a, a horror fan. Um, my very, very, very first was Scary Stories. That was that was my first introduction into the, the creepy verse. And actually, the first time I went to a comic convention, the first book I got signed was The Crow. <laughs> <laughs> I was not in the industry at all, just clutching my sketchbook and my copy, of my graphic novel, the very worn out Crow. And I was like, please sign, so <laughs> Oh man. Um, and uh, I, I really, man, it's funny. I don't watch a lot of horror. Okay. Because I have terrible nightmares. When I was a kid, I would have the most vivid, horrible, like, yep. I would wake up and tell my friends about it. And they were like, what's happening to you? <laughs> I was like, well, I, I had a dream that I went into a cave and there was this thing that I couldn't see that ripped off my head. And then I was trying to find my head. And they were like, uh, 
maybe you shouldn't eat before bed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I watched Critters and then I couldn't like have a ball of socks on the floor for like a year. <laughs> it wasn't even that scary. <laughs> it was just, just the idea of it. My mind was just like, every ball of socks is out to kill you. I'm like, no. It was it was terrible. It was absolutely terrible. But um man. So what'd uh, you read? Like what horror did you read then if you weren't watching movies? Um or or what did you consume? Like yeah. the the thriller stuff like Hellboy, um, oh, great. Like spooky occult things and um man, even more recently like American Vampire, Scott Snyder's American Vampire. Oh yeah, yeah, amazing. Yeah, I agree. Like, and he himself is such a nice guy. Albuquerque is amazing. Like, it's yeah, amazing. Raphael. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very cool. Absolutely. That's awesome, Maurice. I know. And again, your your uh, your uh, horror uh, knowledge runs deep, as we learned on our uh, our uh, trivia game yeah. of, a couple weeks ago. <laughs> Yeah, arguably too deep, perhaps, but um, uh, yeah, so I was like, I was lucky, like I grew up in a house, my older brother is a, a big horror fan, and my mom was like super liberal in like what she allowed us to watch, particularly what she allowed him to watch, so through him, I started watching horror movies with him and with my mom, with my folks, both of them, um, when I was probably like, I think I saw... Halloween, like the Halloween Nightmare on Elm Street, uh, Friday the 13th when I was like five, six, somewhere around there. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> I've been watching, <laughs> I mean, wildly inappropriate. As a father now, especially, I'm like, oh, God. <laughs> it, it's inconceivable. <laughs> oh, man, I watched the scene with the television, and I watched no TV for a year. That's, no, that's, that's what happened to me. <laughs> well, I used to have... I had a window that was like the window at the end of Nightmare on Elm Street where the mom mm -hmm. gets, you know, sucked through. I had a window like that. And I forever, I walked, like, <laughs> as low as possible and as fast as possible, like, just just flying low and fast <laughs> past that I living, window. <laughs> I was living in Harlem in the 80s and 90s okay. during the time when I, I watched this movie. So, um, unfortunately, it was during, like, the crack epidemic. So oh, when Jesus. I saw like oh. people on heroin or on crack yeah. walking down the street, I was like, oh. like yeah. I knew there were zombies. I knew there were zombies and they were coming to kill me, <laughs> which was half true. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, sadly. <laughs> Jesus. That's terrible, man. And Jim, you were, you grew up in the city and stuff. You grew up in Chicago. And I know you're a you're a guy that uh, likely was much like Murray C watching this stuff at a probably inappropriate age, I'm guessing. Very inappropriate age. Um, yeah, my dad, who does, did not like movies, would take us to this grindhouse theater in Chicago. And um, and they would play either like Shaw Brothers. At 9 o'clock, they would play either like Shaw Brothers or Mexican Westerns. Sure. But And he would take us to these for some reason. He really enjoyed them. But uh, we got there early, and I think I was seven. I think I was seven years old. We got there early and we caught the last half hour of Halloween. And uh, I remember, I can, I, I know my body and my brain both remember this feeling that I was going to die in the theater, that it, that I would die. And, <laughs> wow. and, and you know, I, I wasn't like, that was the worst. I was like, I want to do that all the time. <laughs> and, and, you know, so... It was it was early. The thrill was early, and you know uh, the first book that I read that the first non pictures book that I read on my own that I wanted to read was Cujo, and uh, way too oh god uh, way too young. There's, I learned a lot of new words when I read that book. <laughs> I believe it, man. That's but awesome. There it was it was off to the races. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least it was a uh, cemetery. Then you'd just be. Oh man! <laughs> Have you read Cujo recently? No. Th that dog's thoughts are bad. <laughs> 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 I was reading it. I was like, "Ooh, he shouldn't be saying those things." <laughs> yeah. um, for me, it was uh, The Exorcist, 
And I was, I, I mean, you know, yeah. I mean, uh, again, I'm, you know, I'm a little bit older than you guys, but it's mm -hmm. that scared the hell out of me. Yep, Jacob. Yeah, it was J well, Jacob Slatter. See, Jacob Slatter. I don't know why, because it is. It's a. It really is an intense movie. But for whatever reason, it didn't register to me. I'm so glad you brought that up as a horror film. But it is. There's a lot of. I mean, my God, that and uh, uh, Deadly Dead Deadly Ringers, Jeremy Irons, Dead Ringers, Dead Ringers, yeah. Dead Ringers. Dead Ringers. I mean, yeah, some of those like surgery movies are like really could get creepy. So I get it. Or Michael Crichton's Coma. I remember that as a little <laughs> kid. You know. So, but but yeah, for some reason, Jacob's Ladder. Just seemed like a fever dream, more than than real pure horror. But exactly you know, but why I, it was terrifying. For me. I get it. No, I totally get. It. God damn, you know, twenty years ago when Blair Witch came out, and I'm like, oh, all right, man. fine, I'm I'm in my thirties. Certainly, I'm over being scared. That disturbed the shit out of me, oh, and it really did. That first movie was so effective, and oh my great. god. That kid, that that guy at the end, you know, standing in the cellar. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, you know, my God, a lot of no, yeah, <laughs> nope. So, nope. <laughs> <laughs> that's the thing. So, no, I get it, man, and it's so great to talk about this stuff. Honestly, uh, we we had a great hangout a few weeks, a few months ago uh, during uh, San Diego week, and everyone was sharing their stories of like the first movie that really scared the shit out of them. And and you know, another thing, Jim and I remember. A lot of, I mean, they, they. I think that the horror movie commercials have really tamed down, because I'll tell you, there's one, and I don't know if uh, Fu and Mike have seen this movie. It's Alive, and it was this gross baby. It started off with a bassinet, and you heard the Rockabye Baby theme, and then all of a sudden you heard like the heartbeat, boom, 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 and you, they zoomed in on the on this bassinet, and there was a hand out of the bassinet that had like really long fingernails. So it was like a claw and they were bloody. And literally in that great grindhouse tradition, the voiceover guy's like, it's alive. Don't see it alone, please. And I'm like, okay, I won't. I'm not going to see it at all. <laughs> Jesus, this scared the hell out of me. <clears throat> the Flintstones back on. And literally it would run like in afternoon cartoons. And I'm like, what the hell are they showing? My God. <laughs> at, that, uh, at that same theater, yeah. the movie trailers would be twice as terrifying as half of the movie. I remember night school traumatized me, just just the trailer. It's this girl on a, on one of, what are those called? The carousel on the playground. Oh, yeah. yeah. And a guy with a with a uh, machete just appears and just, as she's coming around, <laughs> he gets her and I, I, that, that was horrifying. And the trailer for Phantasm was scarier to me than the movie was when I finally mm -hmm. saw it. And so there was this like kid, <laughs> There's this kid lying in bed and these things jump out from underneath the bed and grab him and the tall man standing over him. And every night I'd go to bed and worry that that was going to happen to me that night. It has. <laughs> yeah. Oh, <laughs> uh, no. Yeah. No, they were scarier. They were like now they're just kind of they're, they're a little bit tamed down. But yeah, I I remember and this wasn't a scary movie, but I remember that I was scared so bad by the house chair, the house commercial. And House isn't a very scary movie at all. No, House but is the, a cartoon. For I some love reason, that the, movie. Yeah, it's not. A, but the, for some, I mean, this was, mm. this had me when I was like six or seven, I believe. But that commercial was terrifying. And I had already seen Nightmare on Elm Street. You know, like, and I saw that commercial. And I was like, oh, my God, no. You know, That's and uh, I, I didn't watch the movie till like way, way, way later. You know, <laughs> considering all I was watching, I was terrified of, of House, of all things. That's very funny. <laughs> House came out when I was in college, so it was uh, yeah. I could handle House. I honestly I couldn't handle the Nightmare on Elm Street movies or the Halloween movies and stuff. Oh, too intense. Yeah. Too intense. What are you gonna say, Phil? It looked like you were ready to I was thinking. I was like, man, would you classify Swamp Thing as a horror comic? I mean, it's like a monster comic. That's, but it's great, not really that's a great scary. question. Man. I yeah. It started I, out as a straight up horror comic, right? Oh, hundred percent. Right, and. Exactly. Yeah, and Len yeah. Wayne. No, you're right about that. Yeah, and and even I think I I think during the Ellen Moore era as well, there were definitely yeah. horrific moments when Tottlebon and and Rick Veach were uh, drawing the book and stuff. So yeah, God, I remember, and they and it was great because in great horror fashion, I remember uh, this '50s detective character that I don't know if you guys would remember him. I do because I'm a nerd and I read everything. But Roy Raymond 
TV detective was this feature in Detective Comics. And mm -hmm. it was this very plain clothes guy, but he was a TV detective, so he was kind of a celebrity. And to keep his youthful appearance, he was all about plastic <laughs> surgery and stuff like that. And they had him like kind of decompose in a limo. Oh. And and it was and it was great. And it really was like, well, that's honestly a food. That's why certain horror books, I can't even look at them. And I had to I had to uh, read Maurice's plot to talk to him and stuff. And I'm like, all right, I'm reading it. That's fine. And the really, uh, Mike mentioned your uh, your artists uh, because really, it's it's incredibly well drawn, and it really does achieve yeah. the effect. Yeah, Josh uh, uh, Hickson is just a uh, just a brilliant artist, uh, and, and it just is equally good as a storyteller. Like uh, his art, you know, you just look at it; it's so captivating. But what he's doing, uh, panel to panel, the stories, the pages, the way he uh, designs everything. He is just you, one of those uniquely special artists that uh, I, I just expect him to do tremendous things for a very long time, um, and, I, and I'll be thrilled to watch all of it. That's cool, Jim. You you did Sundowners with Seeley. Well, that was more of a was that more of a superhero thing? I mean, it, like how would who you knows what that was? Yeah, we're okay. still trying to figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> well, all of you, it seems like the horror genre is getting more opportunities in today's comic world mm -hmm. uh you know i i really uh i, I mean i th i think there it's it's great to walk into a, a a really deep comic store and and see the horror section be this impressive wall of comics it isn't like one or two shelves like it used to be it's a jump ball anyway get to comment on that yeah it's uh it's definitely expanding and i think um maybe comics as a whole is, is kind of starting to expand as um, I think the medium is changing, it's evolving and um, they're growing pains that, that always happens. But um, I think specifically people are looking for certain things and they're speaking with their dollars. So you know, people are like, I want this, I want more of that here, take my money. Um, and so that enables people to make more things I, I i think you know previously it was like okay what are they buying all right well we're just going to keep making that uh sorry there's no room for these other stories but i think right with all the different kinds of media all the different ways that people can get comics um not just print but web comics and um digital subscriptions or different formats even things like cereal box where you can kind of get a you were talking about um audio horror Oops, cats. Things that go bump <laughs> in the night, absolutely. <laughs> exactly. I'm like, don't kill me. Okay, wait. Okay, no, I'm fine. Uh, just about it. Um, but yeah, things like Serial Box, which is kind of like reviving the audio drama, which is kind of cool. Like, totally. Like, I'm, I'm looking forward to exploring things like that. That's sure. cool. That's amazing. No, the cats, can, the cats can run. That's all right. It's all good. <laughs> um, no, yeah, I think, um, yeah, go ahead, Mike. No, I say it's a good time for horror right now. You know, like overall, we're we're in a great we're in a great time and great place for horror. And the great thing about the horror community, which is a community that I think is the best. I think horror the horror community that you won't find a better fan community around. I, I just I, I adore it and I love being part of it um, as as a you know writer and as a as a fan. But like you, they will go anywhere. They'll go books movies tv comics you know they'll go anywhere you know that's uh you know if tim were here uh tim seeley uh he would he would remark on the, uh, a testament to that because you know hack slash is a book that's been successful for him for for a very long time but I, and i think he would tell you that like the success comes a lot of it not from typical horror it's for i'm sorry from typical comics from it's from the horror community who buy the omnibus you know they're the people who right. buy that big collected versions again and again it's gone through multiple printings and um but yeah overall we're in a great period where you know there's great horror novels you know stephen graham jones paul tremblay daniel trusani released great stuff this year uh you know i mean little to be said about horror films there's so many great ones that are coming out you know through blumhouse through through even smaller independent places uh great tour tv with like i mentioned uh hill house uh channel zero which unfortunately canceled but that's great there's just so much great horror content right now so we're and and comics is no exception we're just we're in a great time for for horror 
Yeah, and I, it seems like the other publishers are uh, taking advantage of okay, Marvel and DC has superheroes, and they and they dabble a little bit in horror, but it does seem these other genres, you know, there's there's a lot more room to do something mm -hmm. effective, and that's why it was great to see with Vault in the plot. But uh, yeah, Jim, I mean, again, as a, as a veteran of, of of drawing horror and stuff like that, are you are you thinking about creator owned uh, horror opportunities for yourself? Oh, I, I've always been interested in that. And I think that, you know, horror never goes away. It never goes away. It just becomes popular for a little while. And then it will, you know, it'll be frowned upon and then it will, it will become popular again. And right now it, it's popular and, but, you know, it's always been there. There's always been horror movies. Sometimes you have to search for them. You know, sometimes you have to when when it's a desert, you you still find water, you know. And, yeah. And uh, in the '80s, it was a boom. It was a huge boom. And then in the '90s, it was still there, but it was like the WB horror movies, you know. Like all of a sudden, it was these PG-13 ones, which you know hardcore people didn't like, but it was also still like a gateway horror for a lot of people. And and you know, so yeah, I don't think it's ever gone away, but. I think that definitely it's always been a great, great platform, like any kind of genre for talking about things that in a less obvious way that you need to get off your chest or convey. And, uh, and it's, it, there's hardly been a better metaphor uh, platform than horror. And uh, so, you know, it's, it just comes and goes as, as uh, you know, the culture, the culture flexes and wanes and right now I'm, I'm happy that it's that it's huge it makes it less fun for me when i go to the conventions and they're jam-packed but because <laughs> i just want to walk around and be you know like be a nerd and and i don't like people of course now i miss it <laughs> now i miss all those people so what am i even talking about who knows right? <laughs> Uh, good What's question. the convention? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, People well, are, what are non luckily, pants? <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Exactly. Um, good question from the uh, from the audience here, from Stefan. Has anyone read Thirty Days of Night, Red Snow? No, I read the okay. first the original, the first Thirty Days of Night, but not the uh, sure. subsequent um, okay. books. Yeah, and I haven't talked to Steve in a long, long time, Niles. Um, I should. I always love his stuff, and Ben, uh, the the original artist, of course, continues oh, yeah. to make great horror as well. So mm -hmm. uh, no, it's always always good to get a recommendation from the audience. Thank you, there, Stefan. I um I want to go back to uh, and stay with movies for a second because mm -hmm. really, what's happening with Blumhouse is amazing, not just as uh, fans of horror, but truly from a business standpoint. And I I, I have mm -hmm. to confess that a lot of times the ebbs and flows of the horror business does fascinate me. And I love this idea that this boutique studio on such a shoestring budget make these incredibly effective movies and everyone's freaking out. Uh, Jim, you made a great observation. I think you're right that as much as I bet those PG-13 movies were a gateway to today's 20-year-olds that are appreciating horror, uh, I think you're right. Older fans were just kind of like, hey, you know, you're – you're you're dulling the blade and not really giving us the the what we need from horror and stuff and the excitement and the the tension and the terror and I think um, Blumhouse has achieved that and I and I really great parodies like the Fantasy Island movie things like that the Invisible Man movie was incredible uh, I mean that's the thing it's like they're taking old concepts and really taking them off for a spin so I mean I, I assume everyone's a Blumhouse fan right now. Oh yeah. oh yeah yeah oh yeah okay. they're the best no fool or too scary a fool what do you think uh yeah that i i kind of <laughs> like american horror story i'm like oh, okay i can i can take it in doses <laughs> like castle rock dark i can go there's some things that just like when i saw it i like i my i couldn't watch my, it my poor husband was worried <laughs> for me he was like are you okay i was literally shaking in the theater like does it float? Like no, mm -mm, no. I didn't. <laughs> when when people were cosplaying, uh, oh. Pennywise, the last couple of years. Seriously, I'm like, all right, there's a guy. I know he's cosplaying, but I really don't need an evil clown watching my panel right now. I'm like, okay, 
great. John, you know there is a clown watching <laughs> the panel this very moment somewhere. <laughs> Right. I, right now, you, right. Absolutely. There's some serial killer that's putting the white out of his face right now. Interesting. Interesting. I'm at a skill list now. Yeah, I, I just, my, my memories are starting to come back, like thinking about the Twilight Zone and like. Um, I see. I love. Mm. Now that's interesting. And like, I don't know. It, it's not quite horror. It's just thriller. It, it's more of a. I understand. Thriller. Well, and you know, like old examples like uh, Night Gallery. You know, Night Gallery, yeah. most of them suck. But there's like, <laughs> Jim, I don't know, 20% of them that are effective? Probably, uh, yeah. Generous. yeah. Yeah, I, I think you're being a little harsh, but. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, real real diehard, you know, I'm talking like, like unhealthily obsessed with horror. People are the most forgiving viewers yes. of garbage in the world. <laughs> and I count myself. <laughs> oh, I'm yeah, totally, yeah. 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 I've yeah. watched objectively awful movies oh yeah and i'm still oh, like man. i enjoyed it yeah it <laughs> wasn't know? bad i don't know <laughs> how does leprechaun get so many sequels <laughs> like, those are like, kind of fun though yes yeah yeah that's why they, they are terrible but jim and i could be like they're pretty good, so good. <laughs> so so let me let me good. tell you a uh, let me tell you a real quick story a friend of mine and is i this went a leprechaun to, story no, but <laughs> it's it's about intolerable oh, film. We went to the Fangoria convention, and uh, oh, there's people no. there who uh, were selling their movies that they had made. Yes, and and uh, I I talked my buddy into buying one. I'm oh, like, come on, you got to yeah. support these artists, man. You know, he's like, all right. So he shelled over twenty bucks, and I asked him later. I was like, how was it? He said, look, it's not that great, but you got to see the ending. I said, okay. And uh, so I borrowed it and I sat through an hour and 20 minutes and then the credits start rolling. And I was like, what was he talking about? So I call him up and I'm like, what do you mean the ending? And he's like, nothing. I just wanted you to sit through that thing like I had. To. <laughs> <laughs> That's outstanding. That's amazing. You know, I'm really glad. Oh, I'm glad for it. No. I'm, I'm really well, we glad. Both... That, yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, I'm really, I'm glad conventions, horror conventions came up because you're right. And it is these, yeah. these little like garage kind of movies. They're like the artist alley first comics mm -hmm. for some of these people. Mm -hmm. And you're absolutely right about that. Yeah. And I love that. That is true. That is the DNA of these like geek conventions that we're all like, Hey, we know it's a first step temp. All right, fine. But you know, we're rooting for you. Try it yeah. or whatever. Yeah. God, I loved, um, the, the documentary American movie mm -hmm. about the guy in Wisconsin that was making his horror movie. And it Classic, was, uh, yeah. co you know, as he called it, Coven. But as one of the actors, uh -huh. it was like, it's Coven like Oven. I don't understand why this guy calls it Coven, <laughs> but whatever. But it's, it's such a great, weird movie. And he goes to his uncle who's got some money to help him, like, bank his movie and stuff. And it, it's that, that truly that can-do spirit that a lot of, you know, a lot of great creators uh, use that and fight through those tough times and those first steps in making their creative efforts and then become great artists to the other guys that it's like the Ed Woods of the world. And I didn't mean to say that with no disrespect because Ed Wood made four more movies than I'll ever make in my life. And I always say that Ed Wood, and it's like, yeah, guess what? Ed Wood made four movies. How many movies did you make? Shut up. Ed Wood, <laughs> Ed Wood there was nothing yes. stopping this yes. guy. And I love that. I love. I really do. I love that yeah. spirit, and I appreciate uh, that level of, of of devotion. And like, I want to make this stuff. I want to do what these other guys. And also the democratization of being able to shoot a movie on your iPhone and have it look pretty yeah. goddamn good, right? actually. Yeah, there's so many different yeah. attachments and things now that you can get for your iPhone to turn it oh, yeah. into a really high quality uh, camera. It's funny. Yeah. I was. Um, um, my husband started reading Hellblazer again, and it kind of started reminding me of all the the other horror comics that I have, or I've been meaning to get back into. Like, um, have any of you guys ever read Gyo by, uh, oh man, how do you pronounce his name? Uh, Junji Ito? Oh, Ito? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Nightmare fuel. Oh, <laughs> wow. Yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah. No. Like, yeah. Um, just, 
oh my god the creepiest yeah. of the creepy and it's it's just it's so believable it's just oh man i just yeah. I get the heebies just thinking about it because you've seen those like horrible little crickets that run around in your basement <laughs> oh Josilla just said a really amazing appreciate. amazing amazing quote. well i must i must be able to appreciate great art then because <laughs> <laughs> Because boy, do I love trash. Another Len from An Englishman in San Diego says uh, recommendation for an upcoming horror book, which will genuinely get under your skin. Uh, gen yeah, uh, Red Fork from Alex uh, Packnadel. Al and Alex is a great writer. He's a good, good guy. Great writer. And Nil Vendrell from it's from TKO. TKO, great publisher right now. Mm -hmm. Doesn't surprise me. So that's awesome. That's great to hear, man. I, I appreciate that. JB, what does he got here? <clears throat> different type of horror which hit home because it actually happened where, I, oh, I see Creep is what he was talking about, is a different oh. type of horror which hit home because it happened where I'm from. Now, yeah, is he yeah. talking about the British one or the more recent one? I don't know, familiar JB, with the uh, British one that takes we'll spot, JB, sure. Yeah, which say is again. fantastic. Say, say again, what, what's up? I've only oh, seen hey. the British one. That takes place in the underground. Look at this guy showing up out of nowhere. Look at this guy. Neely, I'm so sorry. I didn't Who's know you were guy? backstage. You're underneath so many other people. I didn't realize. Uh... Okay, I, I, this whole thing, people tell me 2 o'clock. I, I assume Central. It's Eastern. That didn't help me, so I apologize. I fucked it up. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> well, it, it's, I almost did the so, same thing. Yeah. yeah, I'm glad you were able to jump in, Tim. It's all right, man. And, you know, we, we've been talking about... As I said earlier, you know, uh, the, the trivia night that we had with uh, with Maurice and your wife and stuff. And we're just talking about horror in general. And, uh, you know, the the great new product that's coming out, not only in, uh, in, in film, but also in comics. And that the genre seems to have gotten a, a new shot in the arm. Jim made a point that the PG-13 era of the early 2000s kind of dulled the blade. But now it seems like we're in this new... On the other hand, counterpoint... <laughs> It brought in a lot of young people who are now watching. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's easy to sort of dismiss that stuff, but like all the YA stuff and everything. Thanks, John. <laughs> I know. I, I, well, I'm sorry I brought him in the uh, conversation. What can I say? I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I know. No, are we, are we, they were gateway. They were gateway movies. Yeah. 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 Well, and, and also don't be mad well, at urban legend, guys. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> well, like, but, uh, like if you grew up in the '80s, like we did, I mean, what was your entry point? It was probably Monster Squad, right, or or something to that effect, um, or the Universal horror movies, which are basically PG at best. You know, I mean, they're they're so. I think that having an entry point for horror is always important as a refresh, personally. Uh, oh, and you know, we all benefit from that because we get to make stuff for them coming in. True. Well, speaking of that, have you guys noticed the uh, the descendancy of different filmmakers now? Like, you can almost see the lineage. Like, oh, that guy watched John Carpenter as much as I did yeah. growing up. And now you're seeing the influence of these people. Yeah. <laughs> like, the maybe the yeah. second or third generation are now influencing, like, the fifth generation. I'm with you. Yeah. Yeah. The, the Argento yeah, uh, uh, Disciples. Yeah. Go on, Mike. Excuse me. Yeah. Oh, I, was saying, I was just watching the for the upteenth time, uh, the guest, the uh, Adam oh, Wingard yeah. movie, which is like, that's just a Carpenter movie, man. That's just like, <laughs> the <that's laughs> best way possible. I, I'm a mm -hmm. huge Carpenter fan, but it's like, this is really, really Carpenter. You can see the DNA all over that. That's it's pretty awesome to watch. Mm hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How about, about? Oh, go ahead. No, no, please, Afoy. Uh, no, it's about you guys. I'm just here to help out the conversation. <laughs> Seriously, Thinking please. about gay, it, it reminded me of um, Neil Gaiman talking about not having any horror for his kid and then making it. it. It's kind of an opportunity to sort of give people something at a level they can digest emotionally, and then you know, as as they're fine with dismemberment. <laughs> you want to hold that off as long as possible <laughs> you know depending on the parent you know i know again, your uh, wife tim that's <laughs> that's not going to be a long time <laughs> there there are painted skulls in the sealy house though. We all know this. but here, here's the thing all when i was out walking oh anyway go ahead 
which is awesome about what Neil Gaiman is talking about because I think his stuff for kids is scary. And when I was a kid, I had Time Bandits, which was the most terrifying Loved it. movie when I was a kid. And we had Tron, which was weird and scary. And, <laughs> scary. you know, Crawl. It was like this I stuff. I loved Crawl. Dark yeah. Crystal. Dark Crystal was terrifying when yeah, I was a kid. Dark Crystal is super dark. dark. Yeah. But yeah. The, the Dark Banks <laughs> is also, you know, kind of a good entry point into horror stuff because that's horror that makes you unsettled, right? Like, that's what it's mm -hmm. supposed to do. It makes you mm -hmm. feel. Like all that dark fantasy stuff makes you, you know, you're a kid, you feel awkward and out of place anyway. And then you watch these things and, and you're like brought into this world that is off kilter and you like it because it sort of, you know, it's, you're, it's a, you're doing, taking a tour into a place that makes you feel weird and uncomfortable instead of living in it. Right. Like it's the, you know, and then that gives you the little entry point into horror movies pretty much. <clears throat> what about uh, TV horror? I mean, I, and it's so funny because, this weekend, I, I'm I, I'm a sucker for any rerun channel, and that channel Decades is running the Hammer House of Horror an oh, anthology oh, yeah. series yeah, I today, that. and uh, I think, stuff. I mean, yeah, but now you know, like you were saying before, some channels have gone away, but you know, Shutter is still doing inc an incredible job, and also a lot of the basic cables. I mean, like you know, Fu is working with Lovecraft on HBO, but when you think about, honestly, I think FX has done a great job with their horror stuff. And there's a, and a, certainly American Horror Story and the Strain and things like that. I mean, so yeah, what do, what do we all think of television horror these days? I mean, <laughs> if if it uh, you know if you can figure out a way to do it with television standards, I think that's actually more impressive in some ways. It's kind of easy to build horror. Like, of course, we all like the gory stuff, but that's kind of a cheat to some degree. <laughs> right. uh, and when you don't use it, I think you know often you get more creative stuff. You know, like when you have sort of some of these restrictions, now you have to rely on atmosphere and you have to rely on concept. Uh, you know, you can't go, not that I don't like a good chopped off uh, limb or guts every once in a while, but, <laughs> but there is something to be said about working within a system, you know, and obviously HBO gets away with some different stuff, you know, uh, yeah. than, than network, but um, you're still working within restrictions, you know, and so anything that I think that's why horror survives so well because it can't adapt to all those things, you know. You can do it that's for true. every medium all the time, and it's full of innovation and can be done for you know relatively cheaply and all that stuff. You know, well, look at uh, look at um, X Files. You know that had to yeah. abide by all the standards, and yeah. nobody forgot that episode with the lady in the drawer. Yeah. You know, <laughs> that was on TV. Yeah. Uh, granted, I think they pulled it after one, one the time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or, uh, or the episode Home, where the people were under the floorboards. Yeah, yeah, that's the one I'm talking oh, about. Oh, excuse me. All right. I think I remember it more from the floorboards. Or that um, that head, and I think it was with the circus freaks, with the guy who had the puzzle piece kind of jigsaw yeah. face yeah. coming out of the black ooze or whatever. Like, or Victor Tombs. I still suspiciously eye any air duct near the ground level. <laughs> when I walk into a joint. <laughs> oh, this is interesting. Josh Hood says, did we hear about Bissette and Chris uh, Golden's studio of Screams? They modeled it after the old Hammer anthology books. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, that's all right. I need to write that one down. Yeah. All right. Uh, again, that's... Chris, uh, I wanted to do that studio of Screams. Time, like do a, a Hammer style horror thing so i'm glad uh, he found his collaborator in beset that's awesome doesn't yeah, it yeah. seem like all the old yeah, no, uh no. bernie creepy stuff was like uh illustrated hammer movies yeah 100 percent. oh my god the, yeah definitely you can see you know a lot of the characters are sort of modeled after some of the hammer regulars right mm -hmm. i mean like yeah they, they were such uh big fans of it and the marv wolfman dracula series team of dracula is a hammer horror comic mm -hmm. book like, oh, yeah. so totally with uh, Night Force, with, also Night Force by Marv is also a Hammer horror movie. I was like, going to say Tomb of Dr <laughs> Dracula also had a little dash of Dark Shadows in there too. Oh yeah, yeah. So and it's so funny. Um, I, I again, I love decades, and like I said, they're doing the Hammer anthology series this weekend. But uh, they're running two episodes of Dark Shadows in Chicago at the four a.m. hour, and right now they're in the original like first couple seasons where. I don't know if it uh, broadcast in black and white, but the surviving videotape from those early seasons are black and white. 
<laughs> and I mean, and that that soundtrack was amazing. This is pre Barnabas, right? Actually, these are the first episodes introducing Barnabas. Oh, okay. So I don't know, but man, I'll tell you again, five year old kid, early seventies, we'd stop whatever we were doing when Dark Shadows would come and run to whoever's house was closer to watch it. And I guarantee you, I was behind the couch. I couldn't watch it. It scared the <laughs> hell out of me. <laughs> so, you know, and, and Tim mentioned the Universal movies. What um what of the old school stuff, including like Dark Shadows, all that all that pre Argento, I would say from the Universal <laughs> era through the Hammer years, um, you know, pre-Night of the Living Dead. Any of that stuff, do you think, achieves a real good scare still? Oh, yeah, definitely. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think for we're so used to a certain kind of horror, which is the jump scare, sort of, you know, that's how they do most movie stuff. But I think a lot of those, I was, I did a Vincent Price marathon to catch up on all the stuff I missed. Nice. And a lot of that is Edgar Allan Poe adaptations and, and like gothic stuff. And it doesn't rely on any of that stuff. It relies on, you know, it's it's unsettling, right? It's like, you know, especially the Poe stuff is really about, yeah. you know, cr creeping you out. And th those movies hold on to that. They, they're using Peter Corey and Vincent Price, who are creepy dudes, uh, <laughs> even if they're, you yep. know, different kinds of creepy. So it does make you feel unsettled. The, you know, scared, I think, is tough. Obviously, for us, it's pretty hard to be scared uh, in a movie. But, you know, do I think it still is very functional yeah totally man this stuff works great we just watched um you know mask of the red death with vincent price and that is a great intensely weird movie yeah hard to watch hard to watch in 2020 very hard <laughs> but yeah I yeah because the message oh is yeah really yeah and, and i was unsettled by it um, you know yeah. it's uh, real fast and i will do want to hear everybody else talk i literally uh bought um an american international pictures logo t-shirt recently oh, <laughs> because i found it on t public and i'm so glad because yeah man it's just those those great old studios but no continue did but roger I, I had corman get any of that money <laughs> <laughs> you know he wants it <laughs> absolutely <laughs> John's door with our envelope <laughs> you make exactly. a movie with what you paid for that t-shirt <laughs> <laughs> probably true actually and that's another thing Hopefully i love those watching. i love those stories about uh corman and those guys and how they would make those movies. God, Peter Bogdanovich's uh, first full movie, that movie Targets, which is about uh, a mm -hmm. sniper, and it's a, and it's really a suspense movie. But it started because uh, Roger Corman had two days of shooting that Boris Karloff owed him on a contract, and he gave him that terrible movie, The Terror. And he's like, "Hey, use part of this." And I got Karloff for two days, so you can you know create some new stuff. And Peter Bogdanovich and Polly Platt created Targets. And again, it's more of a suspense movie than a horror movie, but it's a comment on that end of the horror era where Karloff is saying, these movies aren't scary anymore. And from that standpoint, I think, as a horror uh, era artifact, I think is an interesting comment on the genre. Yeah. I don't know if you guys have seen it. Well, it's weird. I, I was thinking about this when I was watching, going back once, like the, the supernatural horror stuff ends in the 70s, basically, because everybody's like turns to cinema verite and starts and that's when stuff gets gritty and like that's when you get the you know more of like home invasion horror and and like you know yeah. slashers and psychos and, and that that sort of switches into that but like it's interesting no one you if you set a movie in all these sort of you know victorian era or like that all these hammer movies are or all those uh vincent price ones it just doesn't scare anybody it's just too fanciful it seems too far away it doesn't you know what i mean it's it's they're beautiful, but I, I think we're so trained to like look for something that feels real and, and immediate, you know. Well, didn't uh, yeah. like uh, the immediacy of it? I, I was listening to a podcast with Taika Waititi, and he was talking about Dracula wasn't scary because he was probably in England, and there's only one of them, and he was probably <laughs> never going to meet up with him, you know. <laughs> and, and so I think that. I think that that's uh, pertinent today as well, you know, and I, th I think that um, when Del Toro did uh, Crimson Peak, yeah, that's about as scary as a Victorian movie has been for me yeah. since I was a kid. And it wasn't that scary. There's some awesome stuff. I love the movie, but it didn't terrify me or anything because I, I'm not going to be that person. Right. I'm tough because like 
those movies exist. Like, you know, if I showed my kids those types of movie, the Universal or like the Gothic stuff, you know, like I think they would be bored. You know, like I think that it wouldn't sure. be like that they weren't scared. They would just be bored because yeah. like where that where those movies hit you now. Like, what scares me about like you know Dracula or Bride of Frankenstein or something uh, in that vein? It's more of an intellectual fright, you know. And I'm like, oh, you know, the the ideas of these movies are so unnerving, and that kind of hits me. But like, it's not like if I showed them, you know, which I wouldn't. But if I showed them Last House, <laughs> Craven's Last House on the Left, <laughs> that's a whole different experience. Show it to <laughs> you them, know? man. What, what can happen? <laughs> or, and it's the it's the pacing it's the pacing of those original movies that are glacially slow that I think do keep them from yeah. really being horrific. But I was going to say. Uh, and it's it's interesting that uh, you uh, you know Jim you mentioned uh, that the podcast was talking about how uh, Watiti would be scared by uh, an, a Victorian vampire. Rom V, the great writer that's currently killing it. I can't remember the name of his comic. I wanted to invite him to this panel. Be, but, sa you be know, Savage George. Yeah. Yes, <clears throat> and it really does spin the Victorian vampire going mm -hmm. to the Middle East, and it ties in that whole. Kind of white. Uh, what's the word? Colonization. I'm yeah. Yes, colonization. The, the whole idea. Yes, the whole idea of colonization with the vampire yeah. story. And what a great opportunity to take horror and now tell them from a different point of view. And yeah. I really think that's incredible. And really, I mean, I, 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 I Rob, all of Rob's stuff is amazing, and a lot of it is horror based. He's a he's a great great writer, and I'm glad he's doing comics today. Well, just talking on that in reference to Lovecraft Country, like right now I'm watching it and I'm super enjoying it when the monsters are on. And the second real historically, uh, you know, accurate portrayals of how people were treated at that time come on, I just shrivel up inside, you know, and it's really hard for me to, to come back from that and enjoy the monstery stuff. And, uh, you know, it's like, I applaud that show for doing that, you know, because uh, it's so easy to to just sort of blur things into the background. And I haven't read this comic. I'm looking forward to reading it because, uh, you know, as a, uh, as a Native person, the second you said colonization, I was like, oh, boy, I don't know. Let's <laughs> give it a go, though. <laughs> well, you know, Ram is, Ram is, uh, is a Middle Eastern gentleman and stuff, and he's... Uh, no, he's really uh, he grew. Oh man, I can't remember where he grew up. Or I tell you right now, you got to watch my word balloon with Rob. Um, listen, we're we're up against the clock, so with the time left, I'm going to go around the horn and let you all talk about what you're currently working on right now because I'd I'd love to hear it, and I know the rest of us would love to hear it. Afua, what's what, you've got your Kickstarter going on? Yeah, I'll have uh, my Kickstarter starting Black Friday of this year, so November 27th for Aquarius, the Book of Myrrh. Um, you can find out more about it on afuarichardson.com. That's A-F-U-A, richardson.com. And then I'm on Twitter Excellent. and Facebook and all those things. Let's and congratulations, that. seriously, on the great work you did for Lovecraft County. Oh, I hope it I hope it results in a, a tie-in book, a full tie-in book and everything. We'll see. Thank you, thank you. Absolutely. Mike? Uh, yeah, so uh, we mentioned the plot is winding to uh, issue eight, which is the end. Um, uh, still, I'm always writing Star Wars, which you know we didn't, you know that's different from horror, but uh, writing Star Wars, I just did a Stranger Things thing. Uh, I have another series of Fault called Waste of Space that's entering its fourth, third arc, something like that. Um, and that's 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 going on, and uh, yeah, some other horror stuff that I got in the works. I have one secret project with Seely that we are. Yay. Yay. Going on and on with yeah, me and me and Tim teaming up. <laughs> That's excellent. Building on that, Tim. What do you got coming up? Um, let's see. We've got money shot and stuff going on, ongoing, yeah, yeah. and uh, vampires masquerade through vault, and then a bunch of secret projects and one with Mike. But also the hack slash Kickstarter launches on Monday. We're doing a hardcover of the first volume. I did a brand new nine page story that I wrote and drew, and we added a bunch of other stuff and cleaned it up. So Monday. Uh, whatever that would day would be, October twenty sixth. Yes, that would be the day of our of our Kickstarter launch. Excellent. And Jim, take us out. What do you got, Jeremy? How oh. are you, buddy? <laughs> <Hey. Yeah. laughs> like, hey. All right. <laughs> I'm sorry, Jeremy. We're at, we're at the last minute here. No, uh, actually, hey, I just wanted to come on and tell you how awesome I think you all are. And I'm eating a uh, a really great uh, oatmeal bar. 
All right, fair enough, man. I'm sorry you couldn't Sweet. join us, but I'm, uh, I'm glad to see you. And Red this Mother, the- everybody, from uh, Boom, a fantastic book that uh, Jeremy's doing. But, uh, this is the greatest panel appearance of all time. I, I, I'm a cameo at the end. I just, I just want to talk about how, how much I uh, excited I am by everything all these other people are doing and that they're incredibly inspiring. And, you know, I love you all. You're the best, Jim. Oh, it's good to see you, man. Jim, what do you got coming up? Me? Uh, well, you've got oh, your, yeah. your, one, your, your autobio uh, comic as well, obviously. Yeah, that's the big thing that's come out and really one of the only things I've been working on this year. It's a memoir about growing up native in uh, the Chicago suburbs and uh, horror plays a huge part of that story. And uh, just, you know, that's pretty much it. It's released through Street Noise. You could get it at any comic shop or uh, bookstore. I direct people to this incredible conversation that I had with Jim about that book. Excuse me, Tim, I didn't mean to step on you, but really this is a great, great book that Jim has made and it's, it absolutely deserves the attention uh, that it merits. So please, Tim, sorry. No, I was going to say best comic I read this year. Uh, I read the previews before, but when I read it on paper, uh, it just all together, it's uh, it's devastating and uh, everybody should check it out. It's uh, it's incredible work. Excellent. Thanks. Guys, I got to close out. I'm so sorry, but we're up against the clock. Evil Ted Smith, the incredible uh, manufacturer of uh, cosplay armor and weapons and helmets, is going to do <laughs> awesome. an amazing demonstration. <laughs> so I uh, suggest you all stay tuned for this incre- incredible presentation with him. Thanks a lot for watching, everybody. More great stuff. Go to BaltimoreComicConLive.com to get the full schedule. Don't forget the Ringos are coming up tonight at 8, and uh, I'll be at the pre-red carpet uh, at uh, 6 p.m. Eastern time. Thanks a lot, everybody. Take care.